and that set off a series of events where the protesters were protected. The, then the secret police came in, they wanted to stop being secret police, and then the wall came down within days. And I think a similar thing is going on. It doesn't matter whether the decision is appealed by the, um, by the commissioner. It doesn't matter whether Lance publishes the um, letter, and I, uh, I'm not sure they will. I think the conversation has changed, and people are going to be treated differently, and words are going to take on a different meaning. And it just was at that moment I was stepping in, not knowing any of these events were going to happen. I blogged a couple of blogs, which I'll come back to. Uh, the first one talked about the uh, fatal flaws in the base kind of fatigue uh, trial. The second one made an argument that the scientific community needed the PACE uh, data released. Um, but the, before that, all people knew about me, uh, certainly in the patient community, was this uh, tweet of had shot post for friends that will lay waste to PACE. And so um, here I am. I'll explain a little bit more about how I got here. Um, I've published over 350 papers. I have over 35,000 citations. Um, I think these kind of metrics are very silly, but people take them very seriously. I've uh, the H index of 84 uh, ranks me above uh, many Nobel Prize winners just because they have different patterns of publishing. Certainly uh, head of all of the PACE investigators. Uh, but I'd like to think I'm not being an intellectual bully because there are more of them. And I certainly agree that they all could come to a debate that uh, mental health was going to uh, hold, but they somehow couldn't fit it in their schedule. Um, but I do have a standing, I do have a credibility, and that makes me different uh, than the patients that have been so neutralized. And um, it's really frustrating to me that many of the things that I'm saying they're taken so seriously are things that uh, patients have said before and they weren't taken seriously. And that's something we've got to change. It pisses me off. Um, an academic editor at Close One, uh, that's not a big deal. It's an open access journal. There are four, I think 4,800 of us uh, editors. We turned out 24,000 papers last year. 6% of all the papers in PubMed uh, are published in our journal. Um, but I use my role as editor to uh, push them about issues. And what I've just done is filed a formal request for the data from the PACE trial uh, cost effectiveness that was published in CLOSE. And CLOSE has teeth. Um, and they enforce the data policy. And I just um, an hour ago got a message um, uh, that my request had been turned over to a freedom, uh, had been turned into a freedom of information act request and would be acted on within 20 days. Um, Pace investigators know not to fight on the turf of close. Um, there's no withholding data. They had to make a commitment to um, sharing data when they publish it. They're proper if they're not ready to do that. And they'll face consequences. They know that. Uh, I'm owner of open access. I'm PubMed Commons. I'll say more about that. I know that Tom and other patients have made effective use of PubMed Commons. It's a place where um, anybody who's ever published anything at all, and there are 26, uh, eligible, 26 million eligible publications, can go there and comment on any article that's published in PubMed and be there for public uh, view. When people go to PubMed to look up an article, they'll find the comments. And so an effective uh, means of strengthening post-publication peer review and taking stuff out of the hands of journalists who control pre-publication. Review. Um, I, I teach scientific writing and critical skills, um, critical quality, uh, there's another one I just like to think, quality of quality, uh, the critical <laughs> quality of the scientific literature. When I'm writing these things, I can't see uh, the problems that I have. What I often do is I write on my laptop and then I, I, I put it up on my uh, my um, <coughs> iPad, and I take it to the cafe, the different form format, I can sometimes see things I didn't see. So there'll be, you'll see these things come up. Um, thanks. Um, I appreciate some of the members of the patient community have taken to uh, proofread my blogs for me and send me discreet messages. Um, I appreciate that. I welcome people to 
doing that. Um, I blog with science-based medicine. That's a pretty scary place uh, where a lot of oncologists go who hate quackery. And I'm a guest blogger there. And, um, and I also blog with Close Mind and Brain. I'm originally from Chelsea, Massachusetts. If you want to know about Chelsea, you watch the movie, the Eastwood movie, Mystic River. It's, uh, it's on the Mystic River. Uh, I read uh, in a book that my father, uh, who's now deceased, was a small-time hoodlum dealing on the fringe of the mob in Chelsea. And for, I not, was never close to my father, but I think most of that's probably true. Um, I, it's certainly a very deprived area. Uh, uh, I was very grateful that uh, I got a uh, scholarship from the Carnegie uh, Foundation in the United States uh, that allowed me to go to college. I took so much financial aid, it was actually uh, $200, uh, $200 a year less than my family income. Uh, it reflected both the cost of Carnegie Tech and my family income, low family. I paid back the Carnegie Group by uh, taking a uh, Carnegie Trust Centenary uh, Visiting Professorship. Almost 50 years to the uh, day, I started at Sterling um, after they I'd gotten their, their letter from them uh, supporting my college, going to college. I was grateful. They, they sent me off to be an engineer. I realized I had no aptitude. I became a psychologist. Here I am. Uh, I'm now living in Philadelphia. And uh, the interesting thing about Philadelphia, that's where S. Queer Mitchell lived. Uh, people know who he is. There was an epidemic of um, post-viral fatigue in the United States at uh, the turn of the century, 19th century. Um, and um, he became an expert in, uh, he prescribed an extreme uh, bed rest to the women and a stay on the dew branch to the men. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt was one of his patients. But one of his women patients was uh, someone who eventually became a feminist. Uh, she fired her doctor, fired her husband who had referred her, and started writing children's books. And I, uh, uh, Charlotte uh, per uh, Gilman Perkins, is that, do I have the hyphenated right? Anybody know? I highly re recommend her book called The Yellow Wallpaper, where she was describing the enforced rest cure and doing nothing but staring at the wallpaper. And her, um, uh, her Weir Mitchell had decided that her fatigue was due to compete with her husband uh, and that she should not uh, should give up her aspirations to stay in bed. He did something similar to William James, William's sister Alice James, and she stayed in bed uh, pretty much until she died of breast cancer uh, 30 years later. Uh, it's pretty horrible treatment, but uh, that's a famous spot. I walked by there getting my espresso and I carry my iPad to go read what I've written and find the uh, mistakes that it really strikes me. There's um, an excellent book about that period, the uh, uh, American nervousness. And as you see some of the struggle even then to decide whether it was neurasthenia or whether it was something post-viral. It was uh, clearly tied to a, uh, a known outbreak of flu that occurred about the same time. Okay. I'm a skeptic. I believe that controversies are resolved by looking at available evidence. But I'm uh, well known for my skepticism about the quality of that evidence. Um, and I don't think these are controversial statements. That most, many findings, perhaps most, in the biomedicine and science uh, literature ultimately exaggerate or are found out to be false. And uh, there's a crisis in the trustworthiness of the scientific literature. Uh, we talk a lot about evidence-based treatment, but I've gotten very suspicious of that being the branding, not a hard-earned uh, uh, designation. And that too often, investigators <coughs> get that branding of their treatment based on weak evidence. It's generated by the promoters of the treatment who have a conflict of interest. Uh, and we were supposed to uh, ignore that. Among the many fights I've gotten into recently, uh, there's a physician, Philip Wilson, uh, in Aberdeen, GP, and he was running a trial in Glasgow of, of uh, triple P parenting, and he began getting suspicious of the evidence base, despite the millions of pounds that were being spent on it. 
He wrote a paper attacking the conflict of interest uh, in the literature in, that had evaluated, had led to the trial. There was an attempt at retaliation. I went after the developments of Triple P parenting, and between us, we collected 54 so far correction and erratum to their articles because of undisclosed conflicts of interest. I got disinvited from a talk uh, a couple months ago in Australia because the uh, other person doing keynote was uh, had made millions off of Triple P, and then I just publicized that I got disinvited. The group put together the funds for me to go there and do the talk at the Skeptics uh, Convention as a place. So I, I do get fights. <laughs> now, I'll say more about Ben Goldacre as the evening goes. He's been guiding force in a lot of the stuff that I've done. Um, and his stand about uh, it's appropriate to pick about dodging claims. It's an acceptable activity. It's not just being a, a pest. And um, unfortunately, he's, uh, he's refused to get involved in this fight. And I'll have something to say about that in a bit. We've had a very nasty uh, set of exchanges going on back and forth in direct messages on Twitter. He thinks that I'm, I'm organizing a group of patients to harass him. Those are very familiar words yes. in England. That's fussy Brits. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but he thinks that I'm part of a conspiracy. Um, and he refuses to comment on Pace because he hasn't read the trial. Now, if you go back on Twitter, you found that he's, uh, he's commented before and very negative about patience. And so it's a cop up. We'll have more to say about that. So, um, my targets of skepticism, and I've been, ref been refining them questionable research practices, and Pace is, gonna rep is full of them but also questionable publication practices. How did the PACE findings come to our attention? What went on in the peer review and in the relationships with the press? And, uh, and so a lot of people, when they look at bad research, they look at methodological issues, uh, the questionable research practices, but I think we need to look at the institutional agenda to provide reward for the bad practices. So it comes around to politics. Bad science is being published with exaggerations of its significance without challenge. This can only be understood by reference to politics. And I have a constant fight with Close about uh, my blog, uh, my blog getting too political, and um, and they'll have to decide. <coughs> have a learning the ways that we need to. They are certainly under pressure from the British Psychological Society to silence me, like other institutions are. So politics decide what gets into what publications, in which forums, who's invited to forums, who's invited to the public or the secret meetings, who can be critical and be heard, and who gets ignored, and who suffers retaliation, and by whom. It's all about politics. You can't understand what lands in our lap as a peer-reviewed uh, scientific claim unless you understand the politics around it. And uh, I've been developing the idea, before I got into the close thing, that we need to develop citizen scientists. These are people who are faced with scientific claim <coughs> the impact on their lives. They either things that they're supposed to do, or that their health care providers are supposed to do with them, or that their, um, their public health policy sets. So I wrote a whole uh, series of blogs about uh, efforts by the British government to re put restrictions on food, fast food outlets as a way of controlling obesity. It's a totally rubbish idea, but people who want to curry favor with the British government torture the results to make it look that way and publish it in BMJ. Um, and so the idea of a citizen scientist is a person who um, has learned to trust their basic mathematical and scientific knowledge to make a judgment do they need to probe an article or find a more trusted uh, source before accept accepting a claim? And a lot of my blogging has been organized around disseminating skills, encouraging skepticism about the claims that we, we all um, deal with. I originally was developing this idea around positive psychology coaches, but I think now it really applies to people like Tom. 
Kinlan and all the members of the community who are desperately uh, looking to, to um, interpret the scientific literature that they have a well-based skepticism about the, the quality of it, the trustworthiness of it. Journalists have a, a, a role to play. They should be, ideally, they should filter material. They should not be at the mercy of what investigators want to tell them to publicize. They have an ethical commitment uh, to, to avoid journalism. Journalism is a word I use a lot in my blogging. That refers to just gullibly accepting what is told by the investigators about what happened in their trial. Ideally, they need to filter exaggerate claims. We know that most junk scientific claims in the media start with exaggerated claims by the investigators and their press officers. Most, um, apps, most bad press coverage of science starts with a bad abstract and a bad ending of an abstract that claims significance and there isn't a basis for claiming. And journalists' responsibility is to filter that by introducing independent evaluations. You saw me go at, if those of you who are on Twitter, go after the mental elf recently, where I expected them to get independent evaluations by clinicians, by other scientists, of the uh, clinical trials they evaluate. So who they get for pace when they couldn't set up a debate? Simon Wesley. And that's hardly an independent source. And so I indicated they were now under a boycott, and I would not uh, tweet them with a little uh, alpha sign uh, uh, so that they wouldn't, uh, get, uh, they wouldn't pick up my tweets anymore. And then I sent them a, a Andre note, you just fucked up, uh, but we can't talk about it now. Because I felt he had developing a role using clinicians and independent junior investigators to interpret the scientific literature for the larger community. When people don't have time or inclination or competence, they can go to these trusted sources. And he just blew it. Okay, my activism, I just don't write, I do things. I identify and I try to correct practices. I promote open access and data sharing. I've been involved in a number of complaints to the US government about uh, uh, researchers who won't share their data. Um, there's one situation I'll be blogging about where investigators put their data up on the web, uh, allowing the scientific community to access it. My uh, graduate student and I accessed the data, and we showed that the results, they claimed were rubbish. They then altered their data, took it down, altered it, put it back up, and wrote other papers saying that we didn't understand their data. Fortunately, my graduate student was very careful, and he kept the, the altered data and the original data, and they're now facing um, uh, ethics complaints um, in the United States. Um, I work hard to strengthen post-publication peer review. The idea is that all of the data that are out there should that have ever been collected, particularly from clinical trials using patients, um, it should be available, and all of it, and we should evaluate it after it gets available, and it should be available, to, uh, the data should be available for reanalysis. And the idea that we take the power away from an editor or two or three cronies and give it to the scientific community and the citizen scientists who, who earn their way into it by, by writing competent critiques. Um, and I uh, tried working on some crowdsourced post publication peer review, working with one of the medical journals now that realized there were computational mistakes in the reporting of a large clinical trial. And if only more people had looked over the tables carefully and compared articles they would see some real discrepancies being developing and being amplified. So the idea is that for a period after uh, data come available, uh, that people scrutinize it and have a forum and reward for, uh, for finding in a collaborative way the faults in the literature. Some of them which are perfectly, on, perfectly honest mistakes, but have important clinical and public health implications. Um, so I go after bad science, but I also go back after bad editorial policies. A lot of journals have had policies that they would not uh, publish a critique if the authors wouldn't respond. So authors got veto power over anything you could say. And journal by journal, I go after that and change that policy. Um, 
and uh, I've gotten around, like I said, I think 54 now with Phil Wilson about uh, triple P parenting. I've got other um, promoters of particular therapies to apologize in, in print uh, as a condition of the paper not being retracted. Uh, is safe uh, for a few animals. Uh, I've tried a number of attempts to get papers retracted. That's a lot harder to, uh, to do that. And we've got to be realistic. Um, there's a real reluctance, not only of authors, but of journals to admit that they've, they've published faulty science. And things are stacked against you if you try to do that. Let's be realistic. It's very important to try anyway and to fail and to publicize the failure. That in itself is progress. You know, we're not lying dead when an effort fails like that. Uh, we're, um, we're publicly reporting, and it's a move in the game. It's a move in the game that ultimately will change things. Um, I got into skepticism when I became head of behavioral oncology at the University of Pennsylvania. And I realized that there was literature out there that encouraged uh, patients to adopt a particular attitude in facing their cancer. And there was some literature out there that suggested going to support groups and expressing positive emotions would um, affect not only their sense of well-being, um, but the, the, the actual disease processes of the cancer. They would live longer. Now, I'm all for support groups for people who want to go to them, but they ought to be honestly presented to them. This will not change your outcomes, the biological outcomes. So um, I took on these claims, and I wrote a series of review papers, in which I really couldn't find much evidence um, that psychological interventions, yeah. That's a really central dichotomy in uh, psychological scientific, psychotherapy um, approaches. What the patient believes can be beneficial, you can't uh, assume that it will be, but if you don't um, offer a promotion of that idea, then they're not going to have the benefit. So the only way of getting the benefit is to be biased. Exactly, except there are ways of testing ideas. and. Um, one of the things that PACE didn't do, now I have a future blog coming out about their inadequate control group, that they, they encouraged a lot of uh, positive expectations about their favorite treatments. The so-called uh, standard medical care, or they, call, they changed it, different, sometimes they call it specialist medical care, there's often no care at all, delivered with no, no positive expectations. So that all of the positive expectations in their trial were centered on the treatments that they were offering. An adequate control group would have provided positive expectations, maybe supportive counseling, uh, maybe talking nicely to patients and finding out about their needs. But they had none of that. So their, what their supposed active ingredient, cognitive behavior therapy, the, um, the, the graded exercise, that was uh, confounded with positive expectations that weren't in the control group. That was a bad trial, and no one seems to be noticing that. I'll, I'll get back to that. But interestingly, as far as the support groups go, from what you're saying, it's supposed to help people with breast cancer, but then you're not allowed to be in a support group. If you're in a support group, that encourages you to think you're ill. So, I mean, so the problem is that a lot of the groups have been done with metastatic cancer. And there's very little that's changed in 25 years in the treatment of metastatic breast cancer. Why they think that attitude would affect it. And you can just look at the data. It uh, put, randomly put people in a support group or, or, or not and see what difference there is in survival time, what time, what difference there is in time recurrence. There are no difference across the trials. And so, uh, and then fighting spirit, that started in England, the idea, there was a very small study that suggested that patients who adopted a fighting spirit, that they, um, that they lived longer, but it was a very small, flawed study. When they moved on to a larger study, they found absolutely no evidence. One of the investigators, Maggie Watson, um, <coughs> said, I'm greatly relieved at this finding, now patients don't have to blame themselves not having a fighting spirit. And her uh, gear, the, her other investigator, got angry with her 
and said, I know that I published a paper in which he said that, but I didn't read the paper, and I, I want to take it back, and he couldn't because they published it. But it developed an attitude. This is a fake article. It's from The Onion in the United States, but it's so close to reality. The patient uh, is told by the